Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning. It's good to have Ryan and Robin Mackey with us, along with Avery and Noah. Glad you're here. It's good to have our sister Sandy with us this morning. Uh, we have many of our number who are struggling with physical infirmities, sickness, difficulties of that nature, and we want to make sure we keep them in our prayers. Hopefully the prayer list in the bulletin is something you might keep with you through the week and put it in your purse or in your shirt pocket or whatever, and when you have some extra time during the week, lift those names to God in prayer. Because it could be that we, there's nothing more effective or more important that we could do than to lift the names of these ones that we love and care about to the Father in prayer on a regular basis. Amen. If you haven't done so already, open your Bibles to John chapter 15. We'll be looking at the words and the teaching of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this morning. This is one of the seven I Am statements made by Jesus in the Gospel of John. In chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And in eight, chapter, chapter 8, verse 12, he says, I am the light of the world. He says, I am the door. In chapter 10, verse 9, I am the true vine in our text today, in chapter 15, verse 1. I am the good shepherd, chapter 10, verse 11. I am the resurrection and the life, chapter 11, verse 25. And I am the way, the truth, and the life, in chapter 14, verse 6. So let's begin. John chapter 15, verse 1, the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. So Jesus says he is the true vine, and that is very important. This means, being the true vine, that he is not counterfeit. Jesus is authentic. He is real. He is genuine. <clears throat> he said in Matthew chapter 24 verses 4 and 5, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Jesus is the true vine. He is authentic. He is real. He is genuine. He is not counterfeit. Gamalo's advice to the Sanhedrin recorded in Acts chapter 5, and let's turn there quickly. Gamaliel had some wise things to say in Acts chapter 5, verses, well, we'll see where we're going here. So Acts chapter 5, so this is when the apostles are called on the carpet before the Sanhedrin. So let's look down in, in chapter 5. Verse 35, so he says to the Sanhedrin, Men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Thaddeus rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee, rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. So he tells them, leave these men alone, because it's a, if it's not of God, it will, it will do the same thing. It will just go away. But if it is of God, then you will find yourselves actually fighting against God, not a place you want to be. So Gamaliel's advice is very sound. And this has continued, this problem has continued into modern times, where we have many counterfeits religions. We have many false Christs, and we have many today uh, claiming to be somebody, as Gamaliel said to the Sanhedrin. But Jesus is the true vine. He is the genuine article. He is the real deal. He is authentic. Verse 2, back to John 15. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, that is, the vine dresser, who is God. And every branch that bears fruit, 
he proves that it may bear more fruit. So we see the thrust here in what Jesus is talking about. The thrust is in the bearing of fruit. That's what he's talking about. And so he says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit. So this branch is the shoot, or it, it is the vine sprout. The vine sprout that grows out of the, out of the vine. And then he says, that does not bear fruit. This word bear means to bring forth, to produce. So that's what the vine sprout does. The branch is to bear fruit or to bring forth uh, produce. <clears throat> and he says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he, the vine dresser, God, takes away. And this word take away is, is simply to remove, uh, to move from its place, to take off or away what is attached to anything. And then the fruit is that, of course, which is produced. It's, it's an effect, a result, a work, an act, a deed. It is talking about the harvest. And then he says, every branch that bears fruit, and that's the category you and I want to be in, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So we see the thrust here. The thrust is the bearing of fruit and the bearing of more and more fruit. And so this word prune uh, or purge means to cleanse of filth and impurity. To prune from useless shoots. So the vine, the vine sprouts that do not produce fruit are taken away, they are removed. And the vine is cleaned so that it can bring forth even more fruit, Jesus teaches. Verse three, he tells his disciples, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Isn't that interesting? You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. This word clean means to be pure. It means to be unstained, to be cleansed by pruning and fitted then to bear fruit. So that's apropos to our text, isn't it? I'll read that again. Cleansed by pruning and fitted to bear fruit. Now metaphorically, it means free from corrupt desire, free from sin, free from guilt. And I like that, free from corrupt desire. And that's what God's Word does. God's Word has cleansing power, amen? <coughs> God's word brings our thinking, our thought life, into harmony with the will of God. But God's word aligns our thinking. And so this word clean is very powerful. Also it means, the word clean means free from every admixture of what is false. We have here the truth. We have something that is rock solid that we can take a stand on. So the Word of God has cleansing power. It purifies, it sanctifies. Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 17, Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy Word is truth. Amen. And then in Psalms 119, verse 9, the question is asked by the psalmist, How can a young man keep his way pure? That's a great question, isn't it? by taking heed thereto according to thy word, by listening to the word of truth, by paying attention, by, um, as we said this morning, digesting it and ingesting it and making it a part of your life by obeying what God says. That's how a young man can keep his way pure. So the word of God has cleansing power. It purifies, it sanctifies. Verse four. Jesus says, abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Well, that's pretty straightforward. This word abide I talk about in the bulletin article, but it means to be present, to remain, to continue, to dwell, to endure. It means to not depart. We have the word in our Bibles, 
um, the falling away, the uh, apostasy, apostasia, which means from stand. Apostasia, or to apostatize, is to move away from your firm stand. And that is the opposite, or the antithesis of this word, abide. It means to not depart, to stand firm, oh, to stand your ground. Verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit, for without me, you can do nothing. And we need to underline that, or highlight that. Now, this is the converse of Philippians 4.13. This is the other side. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things. How? Through Christ who strengthens me. This is the, the opposite side of that. Jesus here is saying, for without me, you can do nothing. And we need to really uh, learn from that. Now let's make some observations on what we've covered so far before we move on. From what Jesus is teaching here, we can know that life for the branch, and the branch is you and me. I had a this chaplain that came to visit when I was stationed in um, on Attu Island in the middle of the Bering Sea on the tip of the Aleutian chain in Alaska. Uh, District 17 thought they would help us out and send this chaplain out to minister to us. Well, when he landed, they sent him to me because I was the only <laughs> religious person. There was 30 of us on the island. And they sent him to my room, so in it came. And we started talking, and this guy was so denominational. And he went to this text, John 15, to try to prove uh, that Jesus sanctioned denominations. He said, Jesus is the vine, the branches are denominations. Well, you can see here, Jesus saying, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, he's not talking about denominations. He's talking about people. He's talking about human beings, I'm not talking about denominations. So we went back and forth on that. But life for the branch, and that's you and me, is found only in the vine. We want to make a mental note of that if we're not taking notes. Life for the branch is found only in the vine. The vine shoot is actually connected to the vine. It's a part of the vine. The branch or the vine sprout is actually an extension of the vine. The branch bears fruit only when it abides in the vine. That's the only time the branch is going to bear fruit. If you take a branch, you break it off the vine, you stick it in the dirt, and you wait to see what happens, you're disappointed. Because the branch can bear fruit only when it abides in the vine. Now when the branch abides in the vine, the vine dresser then purges and cleanses the branch so that it can grow more fruit, which, which is the whole idea of this, the whole purpose of this uh, branch is to bear fruit. The vine supports the branch and gives the branch nourishment, strength, and stability. This is why abiding in the vine is so important. Because the vine is where the branch gets its nourishment, it's where the branch gets its strength, it's where the branch receives its stability. All within the vine. Jesus said in Colossians chapter 2 verses 6 and 7, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. So this idea um, of receiving nourishment and strength and stability from the vine is brought out in this Colossian text. Walk in him, rooted and built up in him. Established, there's a stability, established in the faith. Okay, let's continue on in verse six. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch 
and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. So this word cast out means to throw or let go of a thing without caring where it lands. That's the idea. It's useless, it's worthless, you throw it, you cast it out, you don't even care where it lands. That's the idea of cast out. Wither means to dry up, to shrivel up, to waste away. So when you break the branch off the vine, stick it in the dirt, and wait to see what happens, that's what's going to happen. It's going to dry up, it's going to wither because it's not connected to the vine where the nourishment is, where the strength is, where the stability is. So that's what's going to happen if you are no longer abiding in the vine. And then he says, they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. What kind of picture are we getting here? Back in the early 80s, I was studying with a dear friend who was a Baptist. And we were in this text and he says, well, I don't see hell here. It's not talking about hell. And I pulled a Paul Bullock on him. I says, well, then you tell me what he's talking about. <laughs> so he went down to his footnotes in this fantastic Bible he had. And he spent five to ten minutes trying to explain to me why the text doesn't mean what it says. And yeah. So anyway, what picture are we getting when Jesus says they gather them up and throw them into the fire and they are burned? We're getting a picture of hell, aren't we? That's a picture of hell. We can't get anything else out of that. Verse 7. If, on condition that, allowing that, supposing that, you abide in me and my words abide in you. We want to underline that and highlight that. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, that is so important, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. So the question can be asked, how do we abide in Christ? We abide in Christ, the true vine, by allowing his words to abide in us. That's how it's done. When Christ's words abide in us, that's when we're abiding in the vine. When his words abide in us, and they're a part of us, and we are living in harmony with his will, and obeying the truth of his words. Colossians 3.16 says, <clears throat> Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Romans 10.17, that we talked about in Bible class this morning, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So this word, as we looked at in the John 20, verses 30 and 31 text, this word is what uh, creates faith, establishes faith, nourishes faith, sustains faith. So the word is so important. Now, the, the last part of that, when Jesus says, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Now, this has reference to... A faithful disciple asking that which is in harmony with the will of God. Let's turn to 1 John. Because people look at that and they say, well, I asked for a lot of stuff and it doesn't happen. Well, it needs to be in harmony with the will of God. And that's what John is going to help us with in 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Because God loves us, God is good, he always seeks our good, and he always has our best interest at heart. So those of us who are parents, we know that when our kids asked us for a lot of things, we've said no. And we didn't do it to be the cosmic killjoy or the big meanie. We did it because we love them and we know that what they asked for would be harmful to them or could get them into trouble. It's the same way with our Heavenly Father. God loves us, he's good, he always seeks our good, and always has our best interest at heart. And this is why... What we ask for needs to be in harmony with the will of God. Now, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him. Don't you love that? This is the confidence. The Proverbs 3.21 says the same thing. Your confidence shall be in the Lord. But I love this. This is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything, here's the qualifier. According to his will. He hears us. So that's the confidence we have. And if we know that he hears us, 
whatever we ask that's according to his will. We know that we have the petition as New Testament priests. We've been invited into the very throne room of God, Hebrews chapter 4, right there at the end of the chapter. We've been invited into the very throne room of God. Uh, that, is a place, that is a place of highest privilege. And so this is really a great text. So this has reference, of, as I said, to a faithful disciple asking what is in harmony with the will of God. Let's go back to John chapter 15 and look at verse 8. So by this my Father is glorified. So this is the whole overriding umbrella type thing that you and I are about as Christians, as disciples of Christ. We are to bring glory to God. We see that in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. To God be the glory through the church or by the <coughs> church of Christ. That is to bring glory to God. And then on an individual basis, 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. That's the overriding principle that you and I are working under. We want everything that we do. Think, say, and do to bring honor and glory to God. So by this, my Father is glorified. That, here it is, you bear much fruit. There it is. That has been the whole thrust of this text, of what Jesus is saying, of what he is teaching, the bearing of fruit. So, in this way, you will be my disciples, you will be my followers, you will be my pupils, if you're bearing a lot of fruit. So, God is glorified when his disciples bear much fruit. And it's in the bearing of this fruit that we are identified as being his followers, as being his disciples. But the question we ask is just what is the fruit that we are bearing? What are we talking about? Well, number one, it is the fruit that we've already talked about. It is the fruit of making other disciples. <clears throat> it's the fruit of bringing others to Christ and them coming to a saving knowledge of the truth that's in Christ and becoming new creations in Christ. That's certainly number one. Number two, this bearing of fruit is talking about the fruit of a righteous life. So let's take a look at number two first, the fruit of a righteous life because Without the fruit of a righteous life, the messenger has no credibility. And that's important. We know that the power to save is in the message. Romans chapter 1 verse 16, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel of Christ, is the power of salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the power is in the message. But, for the man on the street, it's the messenger who gives the message credibility because that person on the street is seeing you. They are observing you. And you've heard the, the saying that you may be the only Bible that some people read. So they're watching you. They're watching your conduct, your behavior, how you carry yourself how you talk, these things. So the messenger then is very important in the communication of the gospel message. The messenger, the Christian, must be seen as one who is credible. That is, he or she is believable. They are genuine, they are real, they're not hypocritical. How many times have we heard those around us say, well I don't, uh, attend any church because of all the hypocrites. But they'll go to the ball game with the hypocrites, but they won't go to the church with the hypocrites. But anyway, that's that's an excuse, but it's, it's all, often a very uh, real observation with these folks. They see things that are inconsistent uh, in people that profess to be believers. That's why the messenger must be credible, because a credible messenger gives the message credibility because they're seeing you. You're the one that's, doing, that's communicating the gospel to them. So that's why it's so important. This is why the Lord said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. There that is again. Glorify your Father which is in heaven. 
So when I was teaching the fourth and fifth grade Bible class in Groton, and we were teaching the Sermon on the Mount, we read this text, and then I took out a flashlight, and I turned it on. I said, well, I'm doing what Jesus said. I'm shining my light, letting my light shine, right? And these kids went, no, no, that's not shining your light. Well, wait a minute, it's a light and I'm shining it. That's what Jesus said. They knew that Jesus is talking about our influence. They knew that Jesus was talking about our example. So let your light so shine before men. In other words, your influence, your example. What others are seeing in your life, day in and day out. What others are seeing in your conduct your daily behavior, your manner of life, day in and day out. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. It's the messenger giving the message credibility. Peter says something similar in 1 Peter chapter 2, if you want to turn there. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Actually, we'll read verse 12 as well. So Jesus is saying, let your light so shine before men. And we know that's not turning on a flashlight. We know that's talking about our example, our influence. That's what others are seeing in your life day by day. So now Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, we're in the world, but we're not to be of the world. Abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. We need to mark that one. Underline that one. Because the lusts, the fleshly lusts, take us away from where we need to be. They distract us. They're barriers. They're obstacles into our service uh, for our Lord. So we need to abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. That, that is very powerful language. Having your conduct, and this is what we're talking about now, your behavior, your manner of life, your influence, your example, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, they're seeing, they're watching, glorify God, there it is again, glorify God in the day of visitation. So we want to be sure that we plug in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, that whatever we do, we do all to the glory of God, because it's all through the scripture. That's what we're to be about. So, and the people around us are seeing you. They're watching your manner of life. And so we want to be sure that the message, the messenger gives the message credibility with those around us. So, going back to John 15, the works, the good works or the fruit of a righteous life that others see in you on a daily basis are the result of what? They're the result of you abiding in the vine. You as a branch abiding in the vine. You as a branch um, following the teachings and living a life that's in harmony with the will of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what they're seeing. They're seeing your faith demonstrated before them. And that needs to be a positive thing. So this fruit of a righteous life is expressed beautifully. And I know that we are very familiar with these scriptures, but let's turn to 1 Corinthians 13. We're talking about the fruit of a righteous life that gives the messenger, makes the messenger credible and gives the message credibility when we share the gospel with those around us. So turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 13, look down to verse 4, talking about the fruit of a righteous life that comes as a result of abiding in the vine. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. So. When we're living in harmony with these words, with this, these texts, when these things are evident in our life, this is what those around us are seeing. 
they're seeing this person's different than the other persons I'm seeing. This person's really different. <clears throat> the fruit of a righteous life would certainly include the fruit of the Spirit that's outlined in Galatians chapter 5. Let's turn there. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 5, going down to verse 22. Again, this is the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of a righteous life. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Some versions will have patience. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And we can put in here uh, meekness. We can put in here humility, humble spirit. Self-control. Against such there is no law. No law against being too too self-controlled. There's law laws against not being self-controlled enough. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let's demonstrate that before those around us. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Let's not be like the world. Let's not react uh, to situations and circumstances <coughs> like the world does. Let's not respond to objectionable, objectionable people or difficult people as the world does. But let's do this here. Let's respond in this way because we're abiding in the vine. The fruit of a righteous life is seen in Ephesians 4, verses 20 through 24, very quickly looking at these. <clears throat> Ephesians 4, 20 through 24, these are the things that are going to give the messenger credibility and give the message credibility. But you have not so learned Christ, uh, Ephesians 4, 20. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, we talked about that in Bible class as the truth is in Jesus. He's the true vine. He's the real deal. He's the genuine article. The truth is in Jesus. That you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed, how? In the spirit of your minds. That comes through the Word of God, bringing your life, aligning your thinking, and bringing your life into harmony with the Word of God. That, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So we, we have something to do with this. The action is, involves us. We're putting off the old, we're putting on the new. So... And God doesn't stand back and say, well, I wonder how Terry's going to do today. No, God's involved in this, but we have to give God the go signal. We have to, get God, give, we have to cooperate with God in his efforts to transform us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. We have to cooperate. And we have to give God the go signal, to go ahead and work, work in us as he wants to. A lot of times we resist his efforts. We thwart his efforts through ungodly attitudes and, and just through willing and deliberate sin. Okay, finally, because we can spend a lot of time and go to many scriptures on this most excellent point, but finally, the godly traits listed in Colossians chapter 3, so turn over there. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17, they beautifully describe the fruit of a righteous life. Colossians chapter 3, beginning at verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, that's you, that's me, put on tender mercies. Put on a heart of compassion, other versions will say. Kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, again, patience, bearing with one another. That is so important. Not writing each other off, but bearing with one another. Not getting mad and pouting and saying, I'm not going to talk to that person again, or blah, 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 whatever. No, bearing with one another. One version says putting up with each other's faults. Putting up with, and that's, that's bearing with. That's what it's talking about. Bearing with one another. Forgiving one another. 
Oh, I can hold a grudge as good as anybody, believe me. <laughs> but I'm not supposed to do that in the river. That's not part of abiding in the vine. That's not part of a righteous life. I am to forgive. I'm to forgive another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, Terry, so you also must do. So there's the standard. How can I refuse that? How can I resist that? That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. So, very important. And as we've already noted, the fruit of a righteous life gives the messenger, the Christian, credibility. Because he or she is demonstrating the genuineness, the realness of their faith before others. Day in and day out, the faithful disciple is walking by faith. They are living their faith before others, and others are, are seeing it. Um, they're observing this good conduct, this, this godly example, and they are affected by it. They are impacted by it in a positive way. And when this happens, when they are affected by your good example, uh, your manner of life, the fruit of a righteous life, then... When this happens, Peter's inspired words that are recorded in 1 Peter 3.15, and I'm going to turn there. 1 Peter 3.15. <clears throat> These words will ring true then. So here Peter says, 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. You're, you're setting uh, the Lord Jesus Christ apart in your heart. And always be ready, always be prepared to give an answer, to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Why are they asking? Because they're seeing, they're observing your manner of life. They're seeing something's different. You're giving the message credibility. And so they're asking you a, a, for a reason of the hope that is in you, and you are to answer with meekness and fear. You're to answer in a way that is gentle and respectful to them. Now, when they ask you of the, re uh, of the reason of the hope that you have, then we have their permission then to, uh, to teach them in accordance with Christ's commands that we find in Matthew chapter 28, known as the Great Commission. So the Great Commission is by permission, because we can't go up uninvited and begin barging our way into people's hearts and you know, preaching to them. We can't do that. They have to give us their permission. Remember Philip and the eunuch? Uh, Philip goes up and goes, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch goes, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip up into the chariot. There it is. That's the invitation. That's the permission. That's what we need. So let's turn to Matthew 28 and, and review, because we're familiar with this, review our marching orders, because these are the orders from our Lord. Matthew 28, because they have viewed your manner of life. The fruit of a righteous life is what they've been seeing. And you're giving the message credibility, so they're asking you a reason of the hope you have. And now you're able, you have their permission, you're able to teach them. So Jesus says, all authority has been given to me, and I'm in verse 18 of Matthew 28. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That takes care of it, doesn't it? Go, therefore, and teach all nations. The New King James says, make disciples. That's the bearing of fruit that Jesus is talking about in John 15. Go, therefore. Now, sometimes we see this go. We think, well, I need to go to... China, I need to go to Africa, I need to go to India, I need to go to Russia. Well, it's interesting, in Matthew 10 and 7, when, G when Jesus sends out the limited commission, he says there, as you are going, teach, as you are going, preach. That's the idea. It's the same root word. Go is as you are going in the marketplace, in, in the workplace, in your neighborhoods. As you are going, teach, make disciples. This is the Lord's marching orders here. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. How do we do that? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of folks have a problem with that. A lot of our denominational friends have a problem with what Jesus says here. 
Then Jesus says in verse 20, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Does that include that? And they, a lot of times, observe the Passover. They're quiet. Because they think baptism is a work. They think baptism is something the Church of Christ came up with and shoved down people's throats for years. Well, that's not true. It's God's idea. Baptism is God's. It's Jesus' teaching. That's why when we go to the book of Acts and we see that every conversion includes baptism, that's because the first century church was simply obeying what the Lord commanded here at the end of Matthew. They were simply obeying the Lord's marching orders. That's what they were doing. So, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I love that because we're not in this alone. It's not all up to me. It's not all up to you. God is with us. Jesus is with us, helping us, assisting us every step of the way. We just have to cooperate with him. We just have to want to do his will. Uh, Jesus says something similar in Mark 16. Again, we're familiar with these, but it's always really good to revisit them and become even more familiar with them. Jesus says in Mark 16, verse 15, go, and again, think about as you are going in your daily life. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Salvation comes through communication. Yes, I, I hear people say, well, I think that just living a good life. Well, that's so important. We've proven that. I mean, that, that gives the message credibility. But words must be spoken. Salvation comes through communication. It, people must be taught. They need to learn. So that's where this comes in. So preach the gospel to every creature. Teach all nations, Jesus said in Matthew 28. He who believes and is baptized. Now, who's talking here? Jesus. I'm not making this up. He who believes and is baptized, Jesus says, will be saved. This is in harmony with what he says in Matthew chapter 28. But he who does not believe. Now, if someone doesn't <coughs> believe, are they going to be baptized if they don't believe? No. So it doesn't make any sense that he would say, he who does not believe and is not baptized will be condemned. That's what folks say. They say, well, it doesn't say that is not baptized. We don't have to say that. It's implied. If you don't believe, you're not going to be baptized. So he says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Those are the words of the Lord. And what we see happening in the book of Acts is the Lord's disciples obeying the commands we find in Matthew 28, and in Mark 16. It's that simple. The whole reason Jesus came into the world, he said, was to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. That was his stated mission, at least part of it. That was his stated mission. And if it was Jesus' stated mission, then it, if we're his disciples, if we're his followers, if we're his pupils, his learners, his students, then it's our mission as well, isn't it? So this is all part of the bearing fruit that Jesus talks about in John chapter 15. Jesus said in Matthew 9, 37 and 38, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This is the yield. This is the bearing fruit that Jesus is talking about in John chapter 15. This is why we must let our light shine before others, as Jesus taught in Matthew 5, 16. This is why we need to be ready always to give an answer, to give a defense to everyone who asks us for the reason of the hope that we have. This is why we need to be active and effective in showing our faith and then in sharing our faith with those around us. Philemon 6. This is why we need to teach others, both through example and influence, behavior and manner of life, and with words. Words must be spoken. Salvation will come through communication. So those who gladly receive God's word, according to Jesus, will be baptized for the remission of their sins. And they'll be saved. And the Lord, according to Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47, the Lord will add them to his church, to the body of Christ, of which he is the head. <clears throat> As we get ready to close, turn to 1 Thessalonians 2. <clears throat> and 
and look down to verse 13. First Thessalonians 2, verse 13. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, so there was teaching, right? Teaching of all words was there. You welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. So, this is the word of God. We have the revelation of God. This is the seed. This is the, the saving gospel. This is the teaching. Now, turn over to chapter 4. So those who refuse to hear, those who refuse to obey the word of God, and they reject that, they are rejecting God. They are, they are turning their backs on the great salvation that God so graciously offers through Jesus Christ, his son. And that's confirmed here in verse 8, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 8. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. So when you teach others, when you are setting a, a godly example, and when, you're, when the words are spoken and you're teaching and trying to bring others to a saving knowledge of the truth that's in Jesus Christ, and they reject that, they're not rejecting you, but they're rejecting God. <clears throat> so don't take it personally. It's, sometimes that's hard not to do that, but and don't let it deter you from talking to other people about the Lord. As the inspired writer to the Hebrew Christians observes in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? That's a great question. So your soul is worth more than anything that we could prize or value in this life. It's worth more than gold, which is the most precious metal that, it, that we know of. Your soul is worth so much in God's sight. Do not neglect your salvation. Don't ignore the, your deep spiritual need or put off obeying the gospel of Christ. Receive with meekness, receive with a humble heart, the implanted word which is able to save your souls, as James says in James chapter 2, verse 21. And 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 uh, gives us um, a challenge here. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. What's it saying? Don't put it off. Don't neglect your soul's salvation. Don't put it off another moment. If you need to respond to the grace that God extends to you today through his only begotten son, Jesus. And that's what God does. He extends his grace to you through Jesus Christ, his son, who came to this earth to suffer and shed his blood and die on the cross so that you could have permission of sins and be saved. If you need to repent of unresolved sin in your life, God is calling you to repentance. If you have a need, if we can help you in any way, please come and make your request known while we stand and sing. Thank you.